Uh, okay. So I'm giving you uh, techniques that we like to use uh, with I/O um, in security security proofs. So uh, another useful trick is uh, extraction. So often obfuscation and extraction can be sort of the enemies of each other, but um, there is sort of a particular case where where that's actually not true. Um, so let me just say how we, the strategy that we want to um, invoke when we use it. Um, so I might want to say that uh, the IOs of a program and a functional version of the program are actually indistinguishable, even though they obviously don't have the same functionality because one is punctured and one is not. So there's some differing input T. But otherwise, they're, they're the same. Um, and then the strategy is to show that uh, T is... Uh, Hard to you know, it's hard to find T. So maybe in that case, you can say that the IOs of these two things are uh, indistinguishable. And then I'll do the usual thing and try to argue that the punctured version of, uh, of the program uh, doesn't have. I mean, it lacks the value of P of T, which the adversary needs for its attack. Yeah, so, I mean, you're going to lose, uh, I mean, you're going to pay for it in your reduction. And if you try to do it too many times, then uh, at some point, clearly, it will be distinguishable because half the program will be punctured, and uh, you can easily tell the difference. OK, so there's this notion of uh, differing inputs obfuscation, which this relates to, which is defined uh, in the following way. Um, Security is that uh, for every uh, distinguisher in the DIO game, there's an extractor that extracts a differing input. Okay, so that's uh, what we say for security. Um, DIO implies IO because there is no differing input. Okay, so there can't be an extractor that extracts a differing input. Okay. Um, what I'm going to show here is that if it happens to be the case that two programs differ on, say, only one input, um, then in that case, you will actually be able to extract the, the, um, the differing input if, if you have an I.O. distinguisher. In other words, I.O. implies D.I.O. in the particular case where there's, only, uh, there's an actual ex extractor that will extract the one point at which they differ. So, um, does that make sense? I'll try to explain it again. So, so again, what we want to prove in, uh, in the concept of DIO, the security definition, is that um, if there's a distinguisher between two programs, you obfuscate two programs which don't have the same functionality. And what I want to say is that if I apply my uh, obfuscator to this program, and, and uh, there's a distinguisher, then I, then I can actually take that distinguisher and figure out an input at which they differ. Okay, so that's the concept of, of DIO, that there's an extraction algorithm that extracts a differing input. Are you going to show how to extract? Yes. So, yeah, maybe that yeah, makes things easier. I should just go uh, show how you extract. Uh, um, so, so then what I want to say here is that let's just, just suppose that I apply my indistinguishability obfuscator to two programs that differ at one input. What happens? Right? I don't immediately have any guarantee just from I.O., but I, what I want to say is that uh, if there's a distinguisher for I.O., I can use that dis distinguisher to locate the input at which they differ. I can pull out that value of T at which they differ. And then if I can secondarily argue that for some reason this value of t should be hard to find, uh, well, then I can argue that I.O. implies that, um, but that even though these programs have different functionality, the, uh, their obfuscations are indistinguishable. So you're not saying if there is I.O., then there is D.I.O. You're saying that same I.O. is also a D.I.O. without changing the construction. If there is I.O., there is D.I.O. for programs that differ at only, say, one input. Right, but this D.I.O. is the same as I.O. Right? Yes, it's just the same exact program. Is it a constant number of inputs? Or? 
So, so you lose in the reduction. Um, so, but, well, let me let me describe this, and and you can kind of see how uh, it becomes problematic if there are lots of differing inputs. So I have one question. Uh, it's like the last sentence you wrote that uh, the, the work of the extractor scales with a num uh, number of different. It is somehow counterintuitive that uh, if circuits differ at large number of places, it should be easier to look at the differing inputs rather than this. Is this a manifestation of the proof techniques, or uh, uh, it's something of a fact? Um, let me try to describe on the next slide, and then we'll try to think about what happens when you have more. Okay. So let's suppose you have two programs uh, that are the same except at T. Okay. So I can create sort of lots of in-between programs uh, that for each K, it, it behaves like the first program up, up to input K, and then after that, it behaves like the second program. So for all k less than t, the program p sub k is, is equivalent to the first program. After that, it becomes equivalent to the second program. So you have these two clusters of programs. Okay. I.O. says that the programs in this cluster are, are indistinguishable. <coughs> obfuscations. And in the uh, second cluster, you also have indistinguishability. So if there's some uh, you know, big distinguisher between the endpoints, then, uh, then obviously uh, you can sort of distinguish between programs in the two clusters. And in particular, you can just use binary search to locate the point at which uh, it crosses over. So if you have uh, 10 differing inputs, so, so if there's just one, I can argue that the gap between here and here is really big. You know, it's as, basically as big as the gap between the endpoints in terms of distinguishing ability, right? If it's a really strong I/O scheme. If you have ten different clusters of programs, then if I have an I/O distinguisher that su succeeds with probability epsilon, it's going to sort of distinguish between neighboring clusters with probability epsilon over ten or something like that, right? So, the, so if you have tons of, of differing inputs, it, you know, between neighboring clusters, it, the distinguishing probability is going to be very small. It's going to become smaller and smaller relative to the, to the original success probability of the I.O. distinguisher. And so even though there are many more differing inputs, somehow the fact that the epsilon is smaller could make it more difficult to use some sort of binary search to, to locate uh, a particular point. That's when there are many more, but still negligibly small number, right? If half the inputs are different, you just choose an input at random and find it, right? Uh, right. So I guess, I mean, there's some... Yeah. So this sort of works um, when the number of differing inputs is small, but it's... Uh, I mean, I.O. doesn't apply D.I.O. in general because this doesn't uh, necessarily scale to all sorts of parameter regimes. But when yeah. One thing is th this, this phenomena that when there are many values, it's harder to find them is actually not unique to this. I mean, think of optimization problem. When there is a single uh, optimum, then you can use greedy to get there easily. When there are many, it's harder. It's not a unique thing for you. Sorry, sorry, yeah. So you're showing a reduction. You, you want to say that uh, uh, if there is a distinguisher who can tell the two programs apart, then you can find like you know an extractor. So yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to see what the extractor will do. The extractor gets uh, uh, what these two programs, uh, right? The obfuscation of these two programs. So he has to what obfuscate intermediate programs, uh, like you said himself. But then he needs to test the success probability. I mean, it doesn't look like completely like a trivial. I mean. Yeah, so depending on his original success probability, you might have to, um, you know, no, do lots of iterations. He has to re-obfuscate uh, this side program, so he has, like, yeah. you know, just one sample of these two programs, and he has to find, uh, or, I just want to, it seems like the reduction has to be somewhat non-trivial. You need to be able to test that you can distinguish and things like that. Yeah, you need to sort of run it many times, and so it basically, you know, so that he can distinguish which cluster he's in. He might have to. If the probability is low, you might have to do it many times. Yeah. Yeah. The, su the success probability of the distinguisher is taken over only the coins of the distinguisher, or also over the obfuscation, the randomness in the obfuscation algorithm? Um, 
both? Yeah. If you have a sub exponential IO, do you, do you get this for a super poly? For some super poly? You yeah, so, so you're asking sub, does sub exponential IO imply DIO? Or? Or, or maybe not full blown DIO, but some super poly DIO. Yeah, so if, so for some super poly, it works for some parameter regimes and others not. I mean, you just have to make sure that you don't um, lose some factor that you know breaks one of the components of the um, scheme. So yeah, if all the primitives that you use uh, are you know greater than the number of differing points, then you're probably okay. It goes up to some. It's not just one point. I mean, you can use it beyond one point, but it doesn't work for all parameters. Okay, so now I want to claim that if I uh, puncture a program at just some random input, <coughs> that it's going to be hard to find that input. Okay. Um, so let's give some particular code to my punctured program. Uh, PT. Let's uh, suppose that f is a one-way function, and I define y to be f of t. So, uh, so the particular code that I'm going to give my program is is that uh, let's let it be an objective one-way function. Is that uh, if f, f of x happens to equal this value y, which it only does for t, then I'm going to output bot, and otherwise I'll uh, run the program p. Okay, so that's that's. That's the program p punctured at t. Okay, it just happens to have some weird conditional in there. Uh, but uh, but clearly, um, you know, this uh, t should be hard to find if uh, f is a one-way function, right? So assuming I/O and, and one-way functions, what we get from, from the binary search algorithm before uh, is is that uh, you shouldn't be able to locate this point in, in that. Uh, the I.O. of the two programs should be indistinguishable for a, for a random puncturing. Okay. Does that make sense? So you can get sort of a, a circular security from this. So if you happen to have like, uh, so here's a big, big cycle. Um, so, um, so one application of the, these sort of key cycles where you have uh, you know, secret key encrypted under the next public key is FHE, um, where you know these key cycles are. If you have a key cycle, you can do unbounded uh, computation homomorphically. So, um, but I'm going to make this a really big key cycle because what I want to do is make this key cycle so big that I can embed a, a one-way function uh, into this uh, this domain. But of course, if the key cycle is that big, I can't write it down. So, uh, so what I do is I provide an obfuscation that provides random access to the key cycle. It outputs on input i. It outputs the public uh, public, I, public key and uh, the related encrypted secret key. Okay. And what, what I want to argue here is that you know, if you have a start off with a semantically secure encryption scheme, and you also provide this key cycle, it's still semantically secure. Where is the randomness for the encryption? Uh, uh, you have to put uh, uh, some PRFs in there, uh, you know, punctured PRF. Blah, blah, blah. Well, I think I'll show on the next slide the, the particular code for this. So now I just want to use the argument before that if this, this domain is large, if the space of possible t's is big enough, I can just puncture this program at a random point t, and it should be hard to uh, distinguish the obfuscation of that program from the obfuscation of the original one. Right. But if I do that, if I puncture it, I've, I've destroyed this delicate structure of the cycle. There's no cycle anymore. And once there's no cycle, I can I can basically rely on semantic security and some some hybrid arguments, blah blah blah, to show that I can just sort of unravel this whole key cycle and replace it with a bunch of um, nonsense. Okay. So uh, 
So this, for this to work, I, as I said before, the domain of the you know, places I can, the size of this key cycle has to be exponential so that it supports an injective one-way function. So the one-way function, sorry, previous code had one-way function. I don't see a letter F on this slide. Oh, yeah, no, that was just this, uh, this proof before that I used. Uh, so if, um, oh, I see. So you're saying so just, use it just in general for any program, if, if the uh, space of inputs is big enough uh, to support an injective one-way function, if I puncture it at a random point, then it will be hard to, f to um, distinguish. So, so you're saying this is a, so because here I see the letter F written, on the next slide I don't see the letter F written. You just, uh, <coughs> I, I'm, I'm, no, I mean, I'm just, I mean, the particular, you don't see any code at all really for, for this, uh, for this um, function that I'm obfuscating. I'm just describing this. This, this program's functionality, I can embed some code in it that has, uh, has the function f in it if I wanted. Or, well, at least when I, when I puncture it, I could put the same um, code that I had before here. It should be there. It just, it's transparent font. This is the input-output. <laughs> it's not the description of the function. Oh, I see. This is, this is just the input-output description. There's no... Yeah. So you have to store the exponential number of keys? No, this provides random access to the to the key cycle. But this program has to have all the keys, right? Yes, which it'll generate using some. Well, maybe I should provide the the code for for this. So here's some some sample code for for P. Yeah. It's exponential. Of course, yeah. Well, I I like it for aesthetic reasons because if you have an um, if you have a key cycle, then you can do unbounded uh, FHE. But you can't because the cycle is uh, even even for this. Uh, you just you don't. Okay. I mean, it's kind of weird because yeah, to get it for the actual legitimate evaluator to go all the way around, he would have to do you know an exponential amount of work. But I just aesthetically, I like that you can have an actual key cycle so that in principle you can do uh, so unbounded computation. No, because you will never get to it, right? I mean, I'll keep going when I No, I, 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 didn't, I have the same question. Can you answer it again? Or, I didn't understand so what the question said. Whether this means that IO together with bounded FHE gives unbounded FHE. Yeah. Um, I would say yes, but really you don't even need the circular security for it because you can just have not even a cycle, but just like an obfuscated program like I showed you before, but just, that just provides a super polynomial number of encrypted seeker keys. So you don't technically like this, need the cycle. I, I like the cycle, personal preference. <laughs> yeah, so I mean this is a... Um, and, uh, and uh, various other people, they have exactly this thing here to get um, uh, pure FHE from, from uh, leveled FHE. It's just they don't provide the full cycle because you don't actually need it. There's circular security, some assumption that is made in many places like FHE. Are you saying this assumption in general can be replaced by I.O.? If for some reason we think I.O. is a better assumption than circular security, then we get this, or is it only for circular security with exponential cycles? Or it's only for exponential cycles. So if I have some other result that assumes circular security, I cannot automatically say, well, if I have I.O. No, works. definitely not. And in fact, uh, this result is kind of funny. I, I, it's kind of provocative, actually, because uh, there are results showing that I.O. Uh, doesn't imply circular security for cycles that are small. Okay. Essentially, in the, in the obfuscated program, you, you have inside there uh, like all the different secret keys of the, of the public keys and, and the obfuscator just checks whether the, the encryptions that it receives are, are correspond to a key cycle. No, but it doesn't mean so, that IO doesn't imply circular security. It doesn't mean that there are schemes which are not circular secure if yes. you have the IO. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. 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 IO implies that there are schemes, yes. yeah. but are he's right? saying IO implies that every scheme is uh, circular secure with uh, exponentially many cycles, right? Uh, yeah, there's some, a couple of provisos that I'll have in the um, next slide, but basically, yeah.
Okay, so the provisos that I need are, are that uh, public keys and ciphertext look pseudorandom. But otherwise, yeah. Okay, so here's the particular code um, for um, this, this obfuscated program that generates uh, encrypted secret keys, right? I mean, it generates the randomness um, using a, a PRF. You know, it has to it has to do this for two for the ith key and the ith, i plus oneth key, right? So it, it does this twice. You know, it generates two key pairs, and it, it constructs the encryption of a secret key i plus one under PKI using randomness uh, from the PRF. And then it outputs the public key and secret key. Okay, so you can compare this to a different world that just generates random junk, uh, where essentially all these uh, there are no where there are no secret keys anymore, and essentially the public keys and the ciphertext that are supposed to be output there are just generated directly from a, from a PRF that I mean there's no secret key anymore, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, so in this case it's uh, NCPA. And I claim that these two worlds are indistinguishable where I, I increment um, the transition point from, from U to U plus one. So I, 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 you know, I, I snip something, and then I'm just going to go around the circle and replace everything with junk. And I just want to argue that uh, I can do the step that corresponds to replacing the U or U plus swamp uh, um, key and ciphertext with uh, junk. Just go around the cycle. Um, so I, I, I've already shown you the first part, which is snipping the cycle. Um, okay. So now, um, so the first step is that I'm just going to uh, hardwire the output for u plus one. I can always do that. Okay. And it's I/O security. Um, and then at that point, I can uh, puncture the PRF key at U plus one because I'm not using it anywhere. Okay. I mean, recall that the code um, needed stuff for both I and I plus one, but that's still not a problem um, because I've already hard I've already dealt with U, and at this stage, I'm dealing with uh, U plus one, so I can puncture the PRF key there. Uh, and so that's fine. That's that's I/O security. Okay. And then uh, finally, I can just uh, and once the key is punctured here, I can just argue pseudorandomness of, you know, PPRF security and also the pseudorandomness of the ciphertext and the public key, to say that I can go here and just uh, just generate the output for U plus one just in a pseudorandom way according to. Um, According to that that other program that I defined on the previous page, which generates the public key and ciphertext just pseudo randomly without any secret key, embedded. so I just replaced it with chunk. Does that kind of make sense? You're not using this extractor thing at all. Like this random puncture is undetectable. You're not using random punctures, right? So this I just use that in the first step to um, to argue that I could puncture. Oh, uh, so first step. Yeah, so I, yeah, I mean, if I completed this proof, I would have to sort of explain to you why it makes a difference that there's not a cycle anymore once I've, once I've punctured. But um, so I'm kind of omitting some details. But, but eventually, when you get to the end of this thing, uh, it's, uh, um, there's no extra secret key lurking about that you have to worry about because there's been that snip. But the thing about this, you know, cycle like random failures and detectable. I just, I'm just trying to see if I want to use it. Uh, the use is that it's okay to puncture a program at a random point as long as there is exponential set of points or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you can just use a black box, and you don't need to mention one-way functions or anything like one-way permutation or anything like that. You're right. saying that just follows from the proof. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, uh, these guys did exactly the same thing. Uh, got um, what, I, what I'll call almost pure FHE from level to FHE. They didn't do the whole full loop because you don't really need it. 
Um, and these guys had sort of a um, did sort of a similar um, thing. Um, and like I said, that uh, you know, I, I did this to be a little provocative because for small cycles, uh, um, I/O can 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 break security. I mean, it's not necessarily secure. Okay. I.O. implies that... I.O. implies that, yeah. So the question... <laughs> read inside the parentheses part. Yeah, so the question is whether NCPA implies secure, circular security. Um, I.O. implies that for small cycles, it does not. For cycles that are small enough that you can put that, that whole cycle into the uh, obfuscated program. But as I showed, for big cycles, you know, I don't know if you, you care or not, but you know, for big cycles, that's, that's not, not true. Polynomial size cycles? Yeah. But doesn't apply in the sense that Benny said before, right? Or as a complexity? You can construct it to counterexample. Yeah. One specific counterexample. Okay. Okay. It's not like complexity-wise, it might imply. Yeah, yeah you construct the, uh, um, yeah. what you give in the public key is additionally an obfuscation of something that has the, the, the secret keys embedded in it. and that. That obfuscation just tests wh whether uh, you're giving it a key cycle. If uh, you're giving it a key cycle, and if it does, then it outputs all the secret keys. Yeah, the, same, the same encryption scheme, the fact that it's semantically secure, does not mean that it's circular secure. Right. It does it, not yeah. mean that you cannot construct one from the other. It just means that the same one is. So, what is the word arbitrary in the second one? Huh? Um, Arbitrary polynomial, I guess, yeah. Not arbitrary, arbitrary. <laughs> Actually, what happens when you restrict yourself to a small cycle, but when the complexity of the encryption even, is even smaller than that? You know, so a cycle of size n squared, well, the size of the ciphertext is n, or the size of the public key is n, or something like that. Why should it make any difference? Well, at least the negative example you yeah. can... Uh, sure. So uh, again, for the the first one, uh, NCPA does not imply circular security patients. So is this about not every NCPA encryption is a circular security? Yes. Yes. Is that something that we didn't know before? That we yeah. Have, we can construct the uh, NCPA that are not provable, not circular security, circular security. Yeah. For yeah, for long key cycles, it's non-trivial to prove. If, it, if it's an actual loop where you encrypt the, you know, there's one one key and you encrypt the secret key under that public key, it's it's uh, easier to prove. But for a long key cycle, you have lots of different keys, and it's kind of it's non-trivial to prove that some problem arises. What else can we prove it under other than I/O? Only I/O? Uh, as far as I know, since this is a recent result, I. Don't, Maybe I don't understand. So this first result, it's uh, it's kind of weird. It's like there is a key gen that knows all the keys. So it just shows how given, I don't know, any uh, LFHE, how to construct a very particular thing where the key generator controls all the keys, so the keys are not independently generated, right? I'm just trying to understand it's, uh, in what way is it almost uh, your FHE. Oh, you're saying you construct one scheme with this extra interface. And this extra mm -hmm. interface will be used in the proof of security to argue that uh, you know everything is fine, uh, that it's actually secure or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in both ways, like totally, it's like in both ways you construct something very specific, a very specific counterexample and very specific positive result, right? I'm, I'm not sure in which ways are uh, contradictory. Or I mean, because you, you present it's like small cycles versus big cycles. To me, it doesn't matter. Both of them could be the same cycle of length five. It's just one as a you know, specific scheme which is bad and the other specific scheme which is good. Or maybe I'm, I, I'm missing the... Uh, is it right? Um, it's not like big versus small, it's just in both cases there is a specific scheme. Like one specific scheme, one specific scheme. It could have been for, you know, cycle of... Like, I mean, I'm taking an arbitrary, uh, essentially an arbitrary semantically secure encryption scheme. Here. No, are, are well, you the saying... Well, the point is... Are you saying that I.O. 
implies that NCPA implies circular security for exponential size cycles. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's maybe the answer. That this, that like this negative result is the opposite of it is true for exponential size cycles. Yeah. It, is, it does mean that the I, I.O. implies that any semantic security could be converted uh, to something very specific well, and very different. No, I mean, the, the question is what do you mean by this circle of secure with exponentially size? Uh, size uh, okay, fine. Circle. Yeah, so that's a bit of a problem. You can't write down the cycle, so. Uh, but if you get the cycle in this implicit form, then yeah, it's still okay. secure. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. So maybe I should go to the next application, which is trapdoor permutations, which is uh, actually a very nice application of essentially the same idea. Um, or really, this is where I, I sort of noticed that you could apply the same idea to, to key cycles. So. Um, so we all know and love trapdoor permutations, um, and we have. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have these multilinear maps and obfuscation schemes which seem like a mess and, and would, uh, shouldn't allow something uh, so perfect and diamond-like as, uh, as, a, as a trapdoor permutation. Um, but it turns out that the, uh, uh, it does allow that. Uh, so um, so uh, Batansky, Panath, and, and Wix uh, define the, the following trapdoor per permutation. I'm going to have nodes. And what I want is in a permutation is that I can go from the ith node to the i plus oneth node, right? I mean, that's basically all the functionality I want. I mean, it doesn't have to, you know, this is going to be a very sparse uh, subset of the overall space, but who cares? I just want something where I can go forward and not backward, right? And I also want something that samples from the, from the domain, so, but, you know, don't worry about that. So anyway, so these are the nodes in their trapdoor permutation, which is just uh, index i and PRF evaluated at i. And then to, uh, so that I can go in the forward direction, I provide an obfuscation, which takes uh, input, uh, detects whether it has the correct form. It is, in fact, the ith node for some i, and if so, it outputs the i plus oneth node. So that's their entire uh, trapdoor permutation. We would want the opposite. Right? We would want I.O. from travel permutations. Why would you want to build <laughs> permutations from I.O.? No, it's, it's a fair a, point. I.O. <laughs> is much stronger. This is uh, trapdoor permutation from I.O. plus yeah, but, one-way uh, We have no right? candidate for even one-way permutation. Is, uh, I can't uh, hear you. We had no prior to this, uh, like, for I.O. construction, we had no even heuristic candidate for one-way permutation that resists a quantum attack. No candidate. Mm -hmm. I see. Cool. We also have only one trapdoor permutation based on factoring, right? There is only one candidate, so this is like a second candidate, I guess. It's a little more than what we have. <laughs> <laughs> but your back answer is good. That's satisfying. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just want to remark that you can actually view these uh, these nodes as, as being secret keys in, in the previous uh, key cycle that I described. And to go from one node to the next, you obfuscate a program that outputs an encrypted secret key. And the secret key that you have allows you to de decrypt the next encrypted secret key so that you can go forward in the network. So that's kind of the an analogy or connection between these two. Um, so, but forget all that and, and forget about the sampling. Yeah, you, for the trapdoor permutation, you also need some out way to sample random nodes uh, uh, for it to be kind of useful for applications. And they have something, they have an algorithm that outputs a pseudorandom node. All right, but uh, so I want to prove the security of the, this thing, and it's, it's just basically the same as before. I want to prove that I can't do an inverse. And the way they show it is, is exactly the, as before. I puncture it, uh, the obfuscation at a random point. It's not a cycle anymore. And once there's a cycle, essentially, you know, there's no way to go all the way around uh, to u minus 1. That's, that's sort of all I'm going to say about it. I'm not going to go through the hybrids in this one.
but it, it's basically the same um, same idea. Is it required? Is it enough that the I/O is polynomially hard? Uh, let's see. For this, uh, I think no, because I I think they have to. Um, I think they have to actually. They actually. I think they actually have to. Uh, I'm not completely sure because I didn't go through all the details. But I think they actually have to puncture, or break the links at a lot of these points. Maybe this this T is not entirely random in the entire cycle, but it's random and sort of close to the uh, to the U. And there, you have to be able to do enough hybrids here between these two points. That's because we. You still need the sampling algorithm, so that's that's the subtlety there. Yeah. Sample those points. How does the sampling algorithm sample the right point? The points are very sparse, and if you just output PRG, it's. Uh, yeah, so it's pseudo random, it's not random. Oh, there is, uh, there is IO around it? Uh, sampling, sorry, if you just. The, can you show the sampling algorithm on the previous? Oh, there is IO over here, I see. So that's. Uh, Okay, so um, so that line, line of work kind of started with uh, Patansky, Penneth, and Rosen. They had uh, there's, they proved that uh, finding um, a Nash equilibrium is hard, uh, assuming I/O and sub-exponential one-way functions. Uh, so basically, uh, for Nash equilibrium is PBAD complete. PBAD is this problem of. Uh, Basically, you're given a succinct program that um, allows you to, you know, go forward or backward. There, there's some some graph, underlying graph, where in degree and out degree is at most one, and you're given some compact program on this exponential size program that uh, graph that allows you to go forward or backward. And the question is whether you can find. Um, you start off at a source node. You're given that, and the question is whether you can find some other source or sync node. And they just do something similar. They they, um, they snip the line uh, at a random uh, point, and uh, once it's snipped, uh, basically um, the other source and sync nodes are going to become inaccessible. Just using this program where it's where it, it, that part has been removed. Okay, so I had a, uh, you know, I planned sort of like a, I don't know, a four hour talk or something. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I want to give you some idea of the scope. So that was kind of the techniques, and I want to give you some idea of just like everything that's been done uh, using indistinguishability obfuscation, just so you have some idea of, 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 of the scope of it. So, Craig, let me say once, let's not aim for the four hours. <laughs> Hours. Do whatever you have in your time, and I do want to hope to have a completion of these talks at some later point. Yeah. So oh. don't feel that we need the rest of the two hours in the next seven minutes. Yeah, I, I suspected I wouldn't get to this, but um, I, I just want to give you some that a lot of stuff has been done using I.O. Okay, and I thought it would be fun to sort of group it by area in our uh, boot camp. You know, so FHE, multilinear maps, delegation, multiplayer computation, garbled circuits, RAM, differential privacy. All right, so I'm just going to sort of state the results because obviously at this point I can't really do much more. Um, you can get FHE from I.O. in a public key encryption scheme that is uh, re-randomizable. Okay, so that basically means you can take uh, an encryption of some value. You can produce from via the re-randomization process a perfectly random encryption of that same value. If you have a re-randomizable public key encryption scheme and an I/O, then you get FHE. The re-randomizable part almost takes the part of the bootstrapping to clear the noise. I don't know. I mean, there's not really any noise. Uh, the role that it plays is in um, is in uh, the security proof, <laughs> where um, <laughs> you can just you know. I mean, you can probably read this, right? So um, there are going to be a lot of hybrids in the security proof, and in particular, what, basically what the scheme is going to do is going to take two input ciphertexts. It's going to decrypt them, perform the NAND. Output a ciphertext. 
Okay, and then we're going to do hybrids over like all possible pairs of ciphertext. That's a, it's a lot of hybrids. That's what these J's are. Uh, so you have to be able to do a lot. You have to do hybrids over all these ciphertexts. Okay, so we can boost the I/O security and PPRF security so that that's still not a problem. We can you know we can still that's kind of independent of the encryption scheme. We can still do hybrids over all the possible ciphertexts, even if you know. Um, just because it's kind of independent. Uh, the problem is that there's also this step um, where you need to argue that um, that the outputs of the obfuscated program are are indistinguishable here. And this part of this hybrid has really it has more to do with the encryption scheme itself. It's not like based on the I/O or punctured PRF. It's some, it's a statement about the encryption scheme. And when you're doing uh, an exponential, you know, so if L is the length of the ciphertext and you're doing two to the L hybrids over um, the encryption scheme, that's kind of a problem, right? But it's not a problem if this is statistically re-randomizable. Okay, so you get perfect indistinguishability here. You don't have to worry about any parameter issues in the encryption scheme. That's where it comes up. But there's no noise in the scheme per se. It's just doesn't have much connection at all to previous FHE schemes. Okay, so that's FHE. Uh, Multilinear maps, there's, uh, there's kind of a positive result that uh, an obfuscation of this program which um, basically exponentiates by some hidden value. Um, and it, so it sort of performs you know, a multilinear map type functionality inside the obfuscated program. Um, it's it's still not it's not very satisfying uh, the scheme. Um, it, um, basically, because I mean you can't really combine given sort of an obfuscation for one that has an X inside it and one that has a Y inside it. You can't really combine them to get an obfuscation that has X and Y inside it, right? I mean you can sort of multiply by X and Y and the exponent separately. That's useful for some things like key agreement, where you want to get the product of the exponents of the different guys, uh, but it's not sort of a general multilinear map um, in the fullest sense. So it's kind of cool. Delegation, I talked about uh, constrained signatures. Uh, it's kind of useful for delegation. I don't really have much more to say about I.O. and delegation. It seems like they're kind of better solutions. Uh, you know, Yale will talk about hers. I, uh, there is this paper uh, um, by Mitt and, and others. Um, but I mean, you could consider sort of a more challenging type of delegation where I want to outsource my entire you know, uh, complicated web service to, uh, to an untrusted platform. And so they, they sort of deal with that more complicated situation. So maybe the advantage of IO here is just in the types of you know, more complex uh, types of delegation you can achieve. Um, so there are applications of I/O to MPC. Um, the ones that I think are most interesting are getting a two-round adaptively secure MPC line of works there. Um, and uh, there's this, a second uh, work that shows that you can get that that addresses the communication complexity of MPC. So what if you have a function? You want to do secure function evaluation where the function has extremely long output, much, much longer than the inputs, say. So what then is the communication complexity of, of uh, secure function evaluation in this setting? Can you say that it's sublinear in the output size of the function? That would, well, that would be nice, because in the insecure case, you know, they, they, it is sublinear, right? Uh, so they show that uh, the answer is um, yes. Uh, I kind of wanted to go over this and kind of not. It's, it's kind of complex. Um, so the way you get adaptively secure MPC is that uh, it sort of um, builds on deniable encryption, and uh, uh, which Sahai and Waters did in the original scheme. Um, deniable encryption has an algorithm that allows you to explain some, you know, some value that's been generated. You have an explain algorithm that um, generates randomness that is consistent with some value in the, uh, in the uh, MPC protocol, and that's kind of useful for getting adaptive security. 
Okay. So there's just some way using I.O. and punctured PRFs that just magically I can take a value where I don't know how it was generated, but I can, I can use this explain algorithm to get randomness that explains how, you know, how it was generated. It's not the same randomness that was actually used. It's just some kind of trapdoor uh, randomness that comes out with this explain algorithm. Okay. Um, that. Um, that's basically all I wanted to go over. Um, I mean, there are just tons of uh, applications. Uh, you can sort of look at them. <laughs> um, you know. Okay. Let's just see if I missed anything. Oh, I wanted to uh, just just mention just you know one minute. Um, that bootstrapping I/O. So I described one way to get I/O for general circuits from I/O for uh, for NC1 circuits. A uh, second way that has been done to do that is to use randomized encodings. So you obfuscate a program that's going to output a randomized encoding that that you know um, a garbled circuit that uh, that you can then run. Uh, so this doesn't need FHE to uh, to bootstrap I/O. So it's a it's a different technique. You just need basically punctured PRFs and all the all the usual stuff um, that are in NC1. So there's Benny again. He's, he's doing both randomized encodings and VBB. He did this originally for showed how to do this for VBB, but now we know how to do this for I/O. So not only circuits have been done, but uh, we have I/O for RAM computations. I don't know myself the full details of all these, but it, it looks like it's been pretty much done. Everything is succinct in every way you could possibly imagine <laughs> in terms of the RAM programs. I mean, you know, the, the I.O. is the size of the program. The, you know, everything is, everything is uh, nice and succinct. Differential privacy, there's kind of a love-hate relationship between I.O. and differential privacy. On the one hand, it might be able to help in certain situations to, uh, um, you know, so if you, if you want to use differential privacy to handle like a, a very diverse set of queries, you might need to add more noise than you would like. Whereas functional encryption might allow you to sort of um, do this individually for different types of queries, and so you have to add less noise um, at each step. So, so if I have a function that I, I want uh, a researcher to be able to evaluate on the, the database, I would uh, submit that function to the government. He would provide me with a key, a function, function encryption private key that evaluates the function on the encrypted data and then adds a little noise to the result so that it's um, sanitized enough. Um, so I don't know the full details, but uh, essentially there's the possibility there that you have to add less noise because it's, it's individualized for each function. On the other hand, there's um, traitor tracing, which is kind of the enemy of uh, differential privacy. And we have very efficient uh, traitor tracing schemes from I.O., which has implications for differential privacy. OK. What was the final result? Can we say the final results for differential privacy? I mean, how does say you're, sorry, what's the punchline for differential privacy? I, I don't have the actual like parameters of the trader tracing scheme and what, what exactly that implies for the. What's, what's the point? You can build what's better trader tracing schemes, and so you get uh, stronger hardness results for differential privacy. That's just <laughs> Yeah. So I, essentially, the idea in differential privacy is you want to summarize data so that you don't reveal anything about the individual. The the goal of trader tracing is precisely the opposite. You different uh, pirate decoders can't be uh, summarized in a way that. Uh, hides, um, you should be able to pick out a particular individual. Right, there are more results on complexity theory. There's also watermarking. There was a negative result in the original obfuscation paper for sort of perfect uh, obfuscators that exactly preserve the functionality, but if they only approximately preserve it, uh, and approximately can even be you know, an overwhelming fraction, you can get watermarking uh, from I.O. You know, uh, various good things for hashing, impossibilities, that's it. You know the time will expire. It's pretty predictable in my case. Uh, experience.
you didn't mention the most practical application, writing papers. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty challenging. <laughs> Any other questions? So Not what uh, what's the inside these papers that you just... Uh, oh, I well, I wanted to see the slide on that. Please, you'll do offline. <laughs> <laughs> Up to what extent?